Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Isaiah chapter 23. A pronouncement concerning Tyre. Wail, ships of Tarshish, for your haven has been destroyed. Word has reached them from the land of Cyprus. Mourn, inhabitants of the coastland, your, your merchants of Sidon, your agents have crossed the sea over deep water. Tyre's revenue was the grain from Shihor, the harvest of the Nile. She was the merchant among the nations. Be ashamed, Sidon, the stronghold of the sea, for the sea has spoken. I have not been in labor or given birth. I have not raised young women or brought up young women. When the news reaches Egypt, they will be in anguish over the news about Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish, whale inhabitants of the coastland. Is this your jubilant city, whose origin was in ancient times, whose feet have taken her to reside far away? Who planned this against Tyre, the bestower of the crowns, whose traders are princes and whose merchants are the honored ones of the earth? The Lord of armies planned it to desecrate all its glorious beauty, to disgrace all the honored ones of the earth. Overflow your land like the Nile, daughter of Tarshish. There is no longer anything to restrain you. He stretched out his hand over the sea. He made kingdoms tremble. The Lord has commanded that the Canaanite fortresses, fortresses be destroyed. He said, you will not celebrate any more. Ravished young woman, daughter of Sidon, get up and cross over to Cyprus. Even there, you will have no rest. Look at the land of the Chaldeans, a people who no longer exist. Assyria destined it for desert creatures. They set up their siege towers and stripped its palaces. They made it a ruin. Whale ships of Tarshish, because your fortress is destroyed. On that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the lifespan of one king. At the end of 70 years, what the song says about the prostitute will happen to Tyre. Pick up your lyre. Stroll to the city, you forgotten prostitute. Play skillfully, sing many a song so that you will be remembered. And at the end of the 70 years, the Lord will restore Tyre and she will go back into business, prostituting herself with all the kingdoms of the world throughout the earth. But her profits and wages will be dedicated to the Lord. They will not be stored or saved. For her prophet will go out to those who live in the Lord's presence to provide them with ample food and sacred clothing. It's bad news for Tyre, T-Y-R-E. But even in the end, there is this word of hope, this brief glimmer of restoration. Much of it has to do with economic ruin. Do you remember what Jesus said in encountering the rich young ruler? That it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, at face value, it's that little hole at the end of a needle that allows the needle to carry the thread through the fabric. There's also another theory too that this was a description of a narrow entrance into uh, through it through a city wall's gate. Either way, the illustration proves it, wealth becomes an obstacle to trusting in God. The reason that we titled this series Holy Dissident is to speak about the holiness of God speaking through his prophet who is a dissident. These prophecies were not all written in one sitting. It's not like Isaiah sat down and wrote them all at once. Rather, we see them dispensed over the course of the reigns of the kings of Judah. And this proclamation to the city of Tyre, to, uh, to the region of Tyre rather, would not have been well received. Many of the prophecies or oracles, if you will, that have come through Isaiah through the course of this study, even just uh, even just now, a third of the way through, would have been met with uh, the hot take, yeah, okay, fat chance, All right? Because they seemed so secure. They seemed so well-established. They had so much money in the bank and their economic prosperity seemed so secured that a downfall was, you know, it would have been dismissed as paranoia. They were uniquely positioned geographically along trade routes, and they were naturally very protected. And so they had trade from all around the region. They were very, very wealthy, very well established, and the natural features of their landscape facilitated this really, really well in a way that was safe. And so it would have seemed like, okay, yeah, fat chance, no way this place is going down. This operation is like Fort Knox, all right? Which is funny because we're not on the gold standard anymore. <laughs>
right? That Fort Knox is not what it used to be. And so as this, as this prophecy unfolds, you can see the bleak imagery. You can see even the encouragement to preserve their legacy through song. Cultures are often remembered through their music. And so it's like, Tyre, if you want to ever be remembered, you better write some good songs that make it across the generations. A lot of American music is an amalgamation of styles elsewhere. Some of the only true, uh, some of the only true American styles of music are, are really, uh, really jazz. You know, jazz music kind of developed in, in New Orleans. And, and for that reason, it was really one of the only styles of music that was really invented here. We can't even fully take credit for rock. We owe much of that to the Brits, the Beatles. <laughs> and so as we, in, in the American musical tradition, as we observe the songs that have lasted, that have made a cultural impact, we can trace their roots back to their different cultures and they often come from overseas. So Tyre was given this, the, issued this, this invitation, this challenge, all right? Like preserve your legacy through song because that's about the only way you're going to be remembered. All right, verse 16, pick up your lyre, L-Y-R-E, this is a stringed instrument. Stroll to the city, you forgotten prostitute. Play skillfully, sing many a song, so that you will be remembered. Remember that this is not speaking about a nation that's on its way out. This is speaking about uh, this is speaking about the same. Uh, this is speaking about some of the uh, some of the, the same wealth that made uh, made this region famous in the era of, for example, Jonah. Like part of why uh, Jonah went not to, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He wanted to go to another town. It was because he would become more wealthy. The legacy of Tyre's wealth was immense. And for that reason, it seemed unlikely that they would ever crash. Are you trusting in your wealth? Are we collectively, even as a nation, as the US, are we just trusting in our wealth? Because we're actively conspiring against ourselves, if that's the case. <laughs> we're actively trying to lose wealth. I'm not an economist, but I do know that we've made a lot of the same moves that I would make if I wanted to invent a banana republic. <laughs> it was great to receive a check from the government for each one of my kids, but my bride and I both knew this is going to end up leading to a cost of living expense increase next year that is greater than what they're sending to us. All right, we knew that COVID changed things, that there needed to be some sort of economic relief, but the way we went about it inevitably devalued the dollar and forced the Fed to raise interest rates. They just had to. Because of inflation, interest rates have to go up. They necessarily must go up. Otherwise, we're willingly tanking ourselves. And uh, we're not doing anything about national debt, not even under the Trump administration. We saw some really great economic moves. We became, uh, we became net exporters of petroleum for the first time. But the national debt is still what 31 trillion good grief like it, it, we're not making the right moves and we're making a lot of the wrong moves uh for the long haul and so this is that oscillation that we've seen take place over the short history of the u.s really where we oscillate between uh republicans and democrats you know at least thinking back to the years of lincoln and uh and and we're currently making a lot of the wrong moves and we've still yet to fully literally pay for some of the mistakes of the past so economic ruin may, may, may seem like okay a fat chance like there's no way that the us the wealthiest nation in the history of the world could ever possibly go broke but we're currently doing the things that you would do if you wanted to go broke so imagine this through the lens of tyre in nearby sidon which would later become a part of the syro-phoenician empire all right it's it, this prophecy came true as, as every oracle about Isaiah that pertained to the immediacy of his context, the original contemporary listeners alongside Judah, all of these prophecies came true. The only ones that haven't come true yet are the ones that aren't scheduled to yet because they're apocalyptic in nature. So this word to Tyre is, is particularly poignant because it speaks to a wealthy nation whose wealth is no more. Apply this on an individual level, knowing that we've looked at it in the original context of a wealthy of a wealthy society. Apply it on an individual level. It's good to save. It is good. It's God honoring even to save so that you can give more to ministry, to be debt free. All right, because like Proverbs says, the slave is uh, the borrower is slave to the lender. That's a good thing. It's a great thing. You could operate well within the black. But if your faith is in your savings account. If your sense of security comes not from your trust in the Lord, but in your own 401k, your own Roth IRA, 
your own investments, your own portfolio, your own weird gold stash. I've, I've actually <laughs> ministered to a lot of people who have gold stashed. Uh, you, you wouldn't think that was a thing, but it often is. And oftentimes those people are, are, are going through some crazy stuff. If your faith is in your own reserves, your own savings, it's misplaced. Jesus told us to place our treasure not in earthly things where moth and rust destroy and, and thieves break in and steal, but in heavenly things where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. May your sense of security not be the bottom line of your bank statement. May your sense of security come from the goodness of the Lord. This is what Paul would write about in Philippians 4, one of the most often misquoted verses of the Bible, one of the, one of the Bi verses of the Bible that's most easily taken out of context. I know what it is to have plenty, and I know what it is to be in want. I've learned to be content no matter the circumstances. Philippians 4.13 comes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So as much as, uh, as, much as you got to love Tim Tebow and everything that he does for ministry, that was not what Philippians 4.13 really meant when he put it on his eye shade. <laughs> Rather, it's about the ability to be content no matter what is in your bank account. Because if you idolize your finances, watch out, you're no different from Tyre. All right, you're no different from Tarshish. You're no different from the rich young ruler. And you've actually made it more difficult for yourself to come close to Christ. Whatever is an idol that's in your life, if you're a Christian, get prepared for God to knock it down. May he be Lord in your life. May he be on the throne of your heart. May your treasure be in the things of heaven and not the things of this earth. Because if God could wipe out entire nation states and wealthy societies past, he can absolutely take you down a notch financially. This is like the opposite of prosperity teaching beware. If you're already doing well financially and, if, and your finances have become an idol in your life, be prepared to be humbled by the Lord in a very costly way, quantitatively costly way. May he be Lord. May he be on the throne of your heart. May your heart be in the things of heaven and may your finances follow. If you want to see where your heart is, look at your bank statement. May it be in the things of the Lord.